Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The whole time the Word made flesh does our salvation, He does not cease to be in the very bosom of His Father. That heaven beyond heavens, which none but the eternal Word and the eternal Spirit have ever known. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily, verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the Gospel of John. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Well, people loved by God, we broke off last time with Nicodemus missing by a mile what Jesus was actually communicating to him. And when he tries to point out the unreasonableness of what Jesus is suggesting, our Lord just doubles down and tells him that the only way to enter the kingdom of God is to be born of water and of the Spirit. Now we pick up with Nicodemus's response and Jesus's answer from John chapter 3, beginning at the ninth verse. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 3, verses 9 to 15. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we know that our Lord Jesus spoke truth, even when his words were hard for us to understand. Open our hearts and minds today by your holy word, that we both hear and believe everything our Lord would teach us. We ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Let's work our way through that reading. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Poor Nicodemus, as we saw last time, was getting snared by hearing bodily what Jesus was speaking spiritually. If you ever want proof of St. Paul's insistence that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned, you've got it right here. Nicodemus doesn't get what Jesus is saying at all. And so he asks the unbelief question. How can these things be? Which isn't so real a question as an exclamation proclaiming, Ugh, that makes no sense. But notice in the answer Jesus gives Nicodemus that he is honestly baffled that Nicodemus doesn't get what's being said about being born anew or born from above of water and the Spirit. Now, why would Jesus think that Nicodemus should get that? Now, I suspect it's because Ezekiel rather clearly taught it, and Nicodemus should know the prophecy in Ezekiel. I'm thinking of the prophet's words in his 36th chapter. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Water and spirit, there they are, running together, and with them the gift of a new heart, which, remember, for the Hebrew mind is the center of the will. So when Jesus said water and spirit, he's surprised that Nicodemus misses the reference, because surely being born anew or born from above 
ties beautifully with this gift of God, taking away the stony heart with which we're born and giving us a real human heart that's in line with God because in us dwells the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes further. Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Although it doesn't show very clearly in the English, all the pronouns here have gone into the plural. Jesus uses a we. St. Cyril of Alexandria says, as having in himself the Father and the Spirit naturally, the Savior sets forth the person of the witnesses in plural number. The you here is really y'all. And so not just Nicodemus, but Nicodemus of a piece with those in Israel who just couldn't wrap their minds around the claims of Jesus, weren't sure what to do with them. Truly, truly, again, amen, amen. That is, you can take it to heaven's bank. It's so sure and certain. And what is sure and certain is the veracity of what Jesus knows and witnesses to and what those who are in the spirit and so with Jesus know and bear witness to. Jesus does not bear his witness from hearsay. Jesus bears his witness from experience, what we have seen. But you y'all, do not receive or welcome our testimony. This is, of course, unbelief, which is always the refusal of God's gift. If Nicodemus were in the posture of faith and uncertain as to what Jesus meant, the humble question from his lips would have been this, and how may I be born anew from above? By this water and the spirit, how can I move from flesh born of flesh to spiritual born of the spirit? Teach me, master, how all this may be mine. And then I suspect the Lord would have said something far differently to him. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, odd as it may seem, baptism and regeneration by the spirit This is an earthly thing. It happens here in this world. The old theologians of the church distinguish between economy and theology. By economy, they did not mean money. They meant how God works creation and salvation out in this world, in our time and space. By theology, they meant what John did at the beginning of the gospel, where he dealt with what always was and is and will be way beyond time, the doctrine of the Trinity and the interrelationship of the three persons. Now, I know these days we use theology to describe any talking about God, particularly on the basis of Scripture. But in those early years, they made a pretty sharp distinction between the mystery of how God created the world and redeemed it and exactly who this God is, who does all these marvels and is himself beyond all time and space. Our good friend, the golden-mouthed preacher, St. John Chrysostom, he put it like this. When he said what he did about baptism and the birth by grace that happens here on earth, he was eager to lead them on to his own mysterious and incomprehensible birth from the Father in eternity, from economy to theology. Jesus seems to be running with that kind of a distinction when he calls baptism, being born from above by water and the Spirit, an earthly thing, in contrast to heavenly things. Things, by the way, isn't in the Greek. You could almost translate it If I speak to you of what goes on on earth and you don't believe, how you believe if I speak to you of what happens in heaven? And speak of heaven, he's about to do. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. This is not too different a problem from no one has ever seen God. What does Jesus mean that 
No one has ever ascended into heaven, hasn't he? Read Second Kings and the story of Elijah. And before that, what about Enoch, who walked with God and then wasn't because God took him? The key to the apparent difficulty is probably that we use heaven in a variety of ways. Jesus descended from heaven in a way that no one else could ever come from heaven, because in the flesh of Jesus, the very logos of God dwells personally. This is not just God's nearer presence, as we are wont to say at funerals. This is God himself, God the only begotten, eternally in the embrace of his Father. No one has been there but him in the bosom of the Father. No one. Now, a number of ancient manuscripts have the enigmatic words at the end of this verse, who is in heaven, and I included them in our reading. That is, the Son comes from the Father, but the Son never ceases to be the Son in the Father's bosom, even when he assumes a human nature. St. Augustine put it like this, Behold, he was here and was also in heaven, was here in his flesh, in heaven by his divinity, yes, everywhere by his divinity. In the great hymn of St. Columba, missionary, Christ is the world's redeemer. The church sings this mystery. Down through the realms of darkness, he strode in victory. And at the hour appointed, he rose triumphantly. And now to heaven ascended, he sits upon the throne whence he had ne'er departed, his father's and his own. You get it? The whole time the word made flesh does our salvation he does not cease to be in the very bosom of his father that heaven beyond heavens which none but the eternal word and the eternal spirit have ever known theology there my friends mystery of the trinity to be adored but he comes to us from the father's bosom to save us from theology to economy so And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John once again cites a saying to draw your mind to his cross. You'll recall the grumbling in Numbers 21 and the fiery serpents with their bite and the people crying out to Yahweh for salvation from the just punishment of their sins and how Moses makes a snake on the pole at Yahweh's command, lifts it high. And then whoever humbles himself to look upon the snake is miraculously saved from the serpent's poison. The apocryphal book of Wisdom in chapter 16 references the account and notes, they received a symbol of deliverance to remind them of your law's command. For he who turned toward it was saved, not by what he saw, but by you, the Savior of all. And by this also you convinced our enemies that it is you who delivers from every evil. Another Augustine gem. The serpent's bite was deadly. The Lord's death is life-giving. A serpent is gazed on that the serpent may have no power. What is this? A death is gazed on that death may have no power. Martin Chemnitz the great second-generation reformer of the Lutheran Church, wrote, The Son of God was made in the likeness of sinful flesh without sin. Just as the brazen serpent had the form of a fiery serpent, but without poison, and was lifted up on a pole, so Christ carried our sins in his body on the cross. Is that beautiful or what? Lifted up, of course. That's a technical term in the New Testament for crucifixion. When Jesus prophesies that he will be lifted up, that is exactly how his foes understand him in John 12, 34, and hence their confusion because they'd read in the scriptures that the Christ was supposed to be around forever. How would he be crucified then? Here again, this gospel underlines for you this truth, that what faith in Jesus gives you is eternal life. Obviously, we're going to speak much, much more on that when we deal with the following verses next time. Till then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. For any size gift by the end of 2019, we'll send you an autographed copy of Pastor Whedon's devotional book, Celebrating the Saints. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.